Well, look, all right. Last week I was walking <laughs> into the sanctuary and I overheard a conversation. And, and it was just, it, it was funny to me, but I overheard this conversation, y'all. And it was these two brothers, right? These two brothers was in the, fo- now I, they might have been walking in this, I don't know what they was doing, but I was walking with them. I was just walking beside them. And, and one brother said to the other brother, he said, look, man, I bet you don't know the Lord's Prayer. And the dude looked at him, man, come on. Of course I know the Lord's Prayer. What are you talking about? But look, I know we're in the sanctuary, so let's keep this down. Pastor Derek looking over our shoulder, so let's just keep this down. I'll give you $10 if you can recite the Lord's Prayer. Dude laughs. laughs. Boy, this is the easiest $10 that I got. My, I mean, this is easy, man. This is easy. All right, check this out. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. What up? Dude over here is cracking up. Looking at him. He's like, golly. No, go on it, man. I didn't think you knew. (laughs) Lord have mercy. Y'all, my subject title today (laughs) is Does Our Prayer Change God's Mind? I would expect we should know the difference between a nursery rhyme (laughs) and the Lord's Prayer. Now, I'm glad I got Google. I'm I'm glad I got Google because... I couldn't find that nowhere in the Bible. And when I found out it was a nursery rhyme, I just found out. It's a nursery rhyme. That's the first thing mom and dad gave me was now lay me down to sleep. Amen. I I could have swore it was in King James or something, but it was not. But my sermon title today is, Does Prayer Change God's Mind? And where I would like you to go today is 2 Kings chapter 20. So if you would turn there for me, I'll read verses 1 through 7. And that's 2 Kings chapter 20, um, talking about Hezekiah's illness. Does prayer change God's mind? If you are there, please say amen. Amen. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at a point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, This is what the Lord says. Put your house in order because you are going to die. You will not recover. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, O Lord how I have walked before you faithfully and with a wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Before Isaiah had left the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him. Go back and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, this is what the Lord This is what the Lord, the God of your father David, says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. On the third day from now, you will go up to the temple of the Lord. I will add 15 years to your life. And I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. Does prayer change God's mind? Let me give you a little bit of literary context so we can flow and I'll I'll get up 
I'll um, get up to our target text that I just read for you. Back in that day, both of those kingdoms were divided. So in the northern part of the country, you had Jerusalem. And in the southern part of the country, you had Judah. And in, northern, and the, in the northern part, the enemies was Assyria. They were the giant uh, enemy of God's people on the stage. And in the southern region, they had Egypt. So Egypt was the next big power in that day. And Judah was this little weak country. Because it had been divided. Little weak country and they were unfaithful. Hezekiah's dad was the king before him. He preceded uh, Hezekiah. His name was Ahaz. He was an evil king. And what he decided to do that made it so bad is that we have to remember that God was in the house already. He had a palace. They had that thing called the Ark of the Covenant that he lived in. But what they would not do and what made it so bad in that time is that when the prophet Isaiah would come and tell the kings of that day what the Lord said, they wouldn't listen. And so what King Ahaz, Hezekiah's father did, was go and make treaties or alliances with the Assyrians in the north and the Egyptians in the south. And so what he would do is, is he pretty much would take the money that was in the temple of God in exchange for protection from the Assyrians or the Egyptians. So he created these alliances, and I got to tell you, God was not happy because this was a theocracy. And that means God protects the land and his people. So he wasn't happy with that. Furthermore, they go out and they build these fortified cities. These fortified cities that they strategically place in the north and in the south. So that the kingdom is protected. So if any armies, the Assyrian army, the Egyptian army, and later on the Babylonian army, if they was to come, they would have to get through first these fortified cities, these alliances, these treaties that they had in place. And if they did get there, they would have war with them, and they may overtake them, but they would be telling the king, hey, we got company. Get locked and girded up. And so these fortified cities... God still wasn't pleased with them. He wasn't pleased. God was the protector. And he wanted to make sure that his people were taken care of. But what ended up happening, when I was reading through this subject matter, I remember something that April said last week, and that's why I want y'all to go listen to it. She said this. She said, because... For those of you that don't know, um, her husband uh, had went through um, drug addiction, alcohol addiction for the last 30 years. And that's why you need to, man, you, you got to hear. But anyway, this is what April said. And it, and it just lined up with all this alliances and what we do. And, and April says, mentally, I had my bags packed. I was going to leave him. And I had them packed. And then I decided to posse up. And I'm going to use posse as the equivalent to fortified cities. I'm going to go get my girls. Not, not, not the married girls. I'm going to go get the single girls. Because, see, I've already in my mind packed my bags. And I need somebody to align with how I might be thinking. All right, align, posses, fortified alliances, not trusting God. So in my sanctified imagination, I was like, April must have been doing something close to this. Okay, I, I, there go my married girls. Now I don't want to hear from them. So I ain't going to even talk to them. Here are my single ladies. Oh, hey, y'all, he's he been tripping. Now this is what I'm going to do. He, since he tripped so hard, um, 
I think I'm going to leave. Yeah, girl, leave him. Leave him. I want you to leave him right now. Get out of there because he ain't no good. So leave him. That's what that alliance said. Didn't pray to God yet. This alliance over here, this might be the work alliance. He'll go to work alliance. Hey, that dumb supervisor of mine, he didn't gave us a new workflow, and he didn't did all these things, and, 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 and we can't get our work down, our standards are high, and, and I've joined this alliance, of course. Well, what are we going to do? Do we want to go talk to him about it and, and, and tell him what's going on? No, we're just going to sit here and grumble, okay? Now, here, here go the church alliance. Uh-oh, oh, oh. Man, y'all know that brother, Pastor Felix, and, and, and them Gilberts, man, they, they kind of standoffish, ain't they? Yeah. I, I, I mean, it's, they just get rid of you. When, when you do something wrong, they just get rid of you. Well, I, hey, 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 y'all, why, why don't we pray for them? Nah. Here's what we do. Here's what we do. We deal with the horizontal. We deal with the alliances that God has put in, that, that we have placed in our, in, in, in our way, and we go to them for advice. And so when we go to them for advice first, I'm going to tell you God isn't pleased. God wants you to go vertical first. And when you begin to learn how to go vertical first, God will give you what you need to know. Instead of depending on my boys, Brother Lionel said it well on Wednesday night. I loved, Brother Lionel, how you said that, that we don't know if God is master or servant in our life. What we do is we go to our posse, our boys, and we're getting ready to get married. And, and you know, I got my girl, hey, y'all, what y'all think? Y'all think she's fine like I do? And, and, and we get them to co-sign, and then we bring them over to God and say, this is what I chose. Bless it. Because it's all about the horizontal. It's about those relationships and we forget that one. And that's what made God upset back in this day is because we don't go vertical. We go horizontal and he's not pleased with that. And so we're going to have to see exactly what, what happens later on with those alliances. And so we get to Hezekiah. Hezekiah was 25 years old when he came onto the scene. So he was a young, young king. For all of us that are over 25, y'all, y'all remember what 25 was like? Uh, no, you know, you, you didn't way past it, huh? 25, you. 25 is young, and, and, and those kings back in those days were young because really they didn't live a long life anymore. They died at 50 and 60. It wasn't like back in the old, old Testament when people was living 150 years. They was dying at 60. And so Hezekiah was this young king, but he didn't follow in his father's footsteps. What Hezekiah decided to do was listen to the prophets and when the prophets told him to go do something, because he knew it was coming vertically, he went out and did it. So he went up and cleaned out the temples. Because when his father was there, they was, had Asherah poles, which are uh, uh, female deities, and all kind of stuff was going on in the temple. And Hezekiah went in there and cleaned all that mess up and brought back the priests. He cleaned up all the high places. And everything that they were doing, because what they would even, even if they was, uh, even if they were burning sacrifices to the almighty God, in that day, you were supposed to bring the offering back into the temple. And the priests were supposed to do that for you. And so he cleaned up all that mess. He even began to make relationships with the northern kingdom in Jerusalem and say, hey, guys, come and worship with us. He restored all of that in his time. So that's about when he was 25 years old or so. So about 13, 14 years later, um, in the research, when we get to our uh, targeted text that we read, he was about 39 or 40 years old. And in that, when he was 39 or 40 years old, that's when Isaiah comes to him and says, look, young man. 
God said, it's time for you to go. And I can imagine even me at 40, I'm 51. Dang, man, I, I done done a lot of stuff for you, Lord. But Hezekiah, would, I mean, Isaiah wasn't hearing that. Isaiah said to him, look, God said, get your, get your stuff in order. Get your succession plan in order. Get your will in order because you're going to die. Get your DNR in order. Make sure it's signed. Do not resuscitate so your family knows what to do with you. Get the monies and stuff spread out for the kids. Do everything that you need to do because you're going to die. And you can imagine Hezekiah was heartbroken. Lord, what do I got to do, man? I've done all these things for you. And see, the Bible says at the end of that, after he remembered everything that he'd done, he cried bitterly. Bitterly. And a point I didn't give first service. One of the reasons that he cried bitterly is because they didn't know nothing about the afterlife in that time. So that meant when Hezekiah died, he didn't know what was going to happen. So he was, he was bitterly hurt that he wouldn't be able to be used by God anymore. And so he wept bitterly. And, and it brings me back a point when Dante and April were talking. And, and, and I just, I felt this because it's, it's happened in my own life. And it, it, it just resonated. Dante said when he was up here on stage, he says, I just got to a place that I was totally bankrupt. I was spiritually bankrupt. I was emotionally bankrupt. I was physically bankrupt because all the things that were going on, I was empty. I was empty. And April says something similar that just touched my heart for being the wife that's going through this. She said to pastor, she says, I just had to surrender. I had to give it all and put it at the feet of God. My marriage, my husband, my children, my mother. I just had to put it at the feet of God and surrender to what God wanted. And I think, guys, we have to come to a time in our life where we got to get us out of the picture. See, we, 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 we got so much of us that God cannot get through. And so we do our own thing. And then what's so funny, because we schizophrenic, <laughs> is we get mad at God because we're doing what we want to do. And God won't bless it. In order to make this thing work, you have to be empty. And allow him to fill you up with him. With him. Notice what he said after that. This, this is really good, y'all. This is really good. He, he says to him, this is what Isaiah says. They said, the Bible says Isaiah was walking out and he didn't even get to through the middle court. And ironically, the middle court is where they pray. He didn't even get out of the middle court before God told him, turn around, Isaiah, and go back and talk to Hezekiah. And he turns around and he goes back. And this is his report. God said, he heard your prayer. And he saw your tears. And he's going to heal you. And he's even going to add 15 years on your life from that prayer. But this is what I want you to hear now. This is what you don't hear in the text. God wasn't concerned 
about all the accomplishments that Hezekiah had. That wasn't his concern because we get in this thing about do we work to get in? God's not concerned about you working to get in. You work because you love God, not to get in. When you love someone, you would think that you would do things because you love them. And that's the problem. That's why he didn't look at that. What did he look at? He was bitterly crying. God looks at this. The broken heart. The contrite heart. He wants you with a humble spirit. He's not worried about your argument on why you should live or why you should get whatever it is that you're praying for. He wants to know if your heart is right. That's what Kathy and I talked about during service. It's about your heart. I am one of, I'm not a prosperity guy whatsoever. God can do whatever God wants to do. Period. We can't make him do nothing, I don't think. God's going to do what God wants to do, but I think... God will hear our prayers and change his mind when he sees you break down. When he sees you surrender it all. God will begin to do something different in our lives. Here's part, the B part of this verse. Now this, now, I get a little excited. So, this part excited me, y'all. It just, it just showed me where God is. It showed me where God is. So I'm going to encourage you. Two things. Go back and look at that video because it was powerful. The second thing is pick up your Bible and read 2 Corinthians chapter 19 right around the 25th verse, 20, 25th verse, because that's what I'm going to go to. Second. Kings, thank you, elder. Thank you, pastor. Second Kings chapter 19, right around the 25th verse. Because it was so cold. Now, let me read the B part of verse 6 to you. Here's the B part. I will deliver you and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend the city for my sake. And for my servant David's sake. He's not defending the kingdom for Hezekiah. He's defending it for his own sake. You're not going to come up into his house and do anything in his house without his permission. So when you get over to chapter 19, he begins to break it down through Isaiah. And Isaiah, the, 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 the Assyrians was, was talking big stuff. They was talking big stuff in the house. They was like, man, we're going to run up on your fortified cities and we're going to destroy them. And they was, yeah, they was taunting the people of God. We coming and getting busy on y'all. And here's what God said through Isaiah. He said, hey, dummy, this, this is the gospel in court to Derek. I just want y'all to know that. This is my summarization. Hey, dummy, king of Assyria. I'm the one that went way back in the day, and I already knew you was going to come and take out them fortified cities. I didn't want them anyway because the people didn't trust me. So, king, I wanted you to knock over the fortified city so they could understand who I am. And that's what he began to do. So the people came in. They, 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 they destroying the cities, being all happy. And God said, I wanted you to do that. Okay, now this is what I'm going to do. I'm summarizing now. I'm going to put a hook in your nose. And I'm going to put a bit in your mouth. And I'm going to turn you around just like a horse. And I'm going to send you on your way. There will not be an arrow that touches my uh, kingdom. 
nothing will touch it. You guys won't lay siege on it. You won't be able to do anything. And a siege is they, they came around the kingdom and they would cut off your water supply and your food supply. And basically, they would have the people starve. He said, you go, you're not even going to do that. You ain't even going to get close enough to do that. I'm going to take care of all that mess. And what he did was he sent an angel and 185 Thousands of Syrians dropped dead that night. Here's what I'm telling you. When you begin to empty yourself, and you empty yourself, and most times it's because we went through something. Most time, we got to get to a place that God can hear us. That's what happened to me in my lifetime. When bankruptcy came and 2008 came and everything began to go, that's what he had to do. He had to get me on my knees. And he had to make me just sit there and bitterly cry and empty myself. I believe that's where Dante and April was. You got to empty yourself. And when he begins to fill you up with him, and then you take that to God the Father. See, the God in me begins to talk to God the Father. And I believe then that's when prayer can change God's mind because he goes to himself. <laughs> Y'all getting this? He went... When, when we decrease and allow God to increase in our lives, he goes to himself on your behalf. Y'all got to hear me now. <laughs> it's exciting to me. I know this is second service. The second service don't get excited. But y'all look, that's exciting to me. If you want to follow God, empty yourself of you. And allow him to fill you up. And allow him to go on your behalf. That's what happened to Hezekiah. See, y'all, we used... See, this is why, Dante, this is why it took 20 years to get to where you're going. Because we're creating alliances. We're doing what we want to do. And then God has to bring us to our knees. And say, are you ready yet? That prayer that Hezekiah, I don't know how long it took, but the word says he turned around in the middle court. He didn't even get out the palace before God had given him an answer. I don't think it has to take that long. Pastor did this cool, he did this cool sermon on how prayers get to the Father. And so... I believe when it's us praying and we haven't been emptied out, Gabriel might get it. Michael, the archangel, might get it. And they got to fight through all these principalities and all this stuff to get your prayers through. But I believe if the God in me goes to God the Father... He don't give it to Gabriel and Michael. <laughs> he go to himself vertically and takes care of the business of God. Man, that's awesome, y'all. That's awesome. Man, when, when, I, when I began to understand that, that God is going to protect his house, that was outstanding to me. But we got to be willing to walk obedient. We got to be willing to say, I don't know it all. God help me. And we got to go vertical first. Vertical first. So worship team, you can come. I'm getting ready to close. Does prayer change God's mind? I would tell you I believe so. I would say yes to that question. But if you don't want it to just happen over the next 20, 25, 30 years, my suggestion to you 
would be to empty yourself of you and allow God to fill him up. Dante said a powerful thing. He said he had went to God several times during this 20, 30 year period. And it wasn't until spoke, God spoke through his heart that the change came. God is not looking at our actions. This flesh suit is going to sin. But the Ark of the Covenant lives inside of us. And if you want him to protect your house, give him the keys. Give him the keys and trust and do something different. If your life continues to be up and down and up and down and up and down, I would believe at some point we would get tired of that. And when you're tired, turn over the keys because God is going to protect his house. Dante put it like this, and I'm out of here because I liked it. Put God first. Put him first. Don't go to your horizontal alliances to get your information. Learn how to pray vertically. And my own daddy came to me as we we're getting ready to leave this today. And he said, Derek, he says to me, son, I don't know how to pray. How do I pray? And I like this dude called Les Miles. And Les Miles says, you don't have to be great to start, but you gotta start to be great. And I told my daddy, just start having conversations with him. Don't try to have no big words and I'll pray nobody. Just talk to him and he'll begin to show you what it means to pray. So keep God first. Always be ready to do the next right thing would lead you back to God first. And then always keep your integrity intact. And you will always be on a roll because these flesh suits sin. That we can always find our way back to it. And we don't have to give up.